always be closing. Always be closing. Welcome to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals who work with investors, buyers, and sellers of commercial real estate coast to coast. Whether you're an investor, broker, lender, property manager, attorney, or accountant, we're here to learn from the experts. Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio. We're so glad you could join us. My name is Jay Darren Gross. I'm a real estate investor and a commercial property insurance broker. I've been an insurance broker for 25 plus years. My primary clients are real estate professionals dealing in multifamily, retail, warehouse, office, and development. Based on this, I'm continually looking for more information about real estate investing so that I can better serve my clients and also to use my own investing. The result of these efforts has led to the creation of Commercial Real Estate Pro Network, and CREPN Radio. If you like what we're doing, be sure to take a minute and subscribe to our show on iTunes. Uh, if you do, we'd also love to see your comments and uh, show us what you what you think of what we're doing. Uh, we've got some great guests lined up, and our ability to attract good guests uh, is largely uh, dependent on the um, uh, likes, uh, the comments, and the number of subscribers. So uh, please, if you would take a minute and subscribe and comment, we would greatly appreciate that. Also, if you have any real estate insurance questions, I want to invite you to give me a call, uh, You know, send me a message. I'll do anything I can to help. You can uh, reach me, go to the contact uh, button on jdarengross.com, or you can also do that through Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. Dot com. And before we, uh, one more thing before we get going here, if you're on LinkedIn, uh, be sure to check out our group. We've got a, a group on LinkedIn, Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. Uh, there's a lot of great uh, professionals in there and opportunities to uh, network and do some business. All right, let's get on with the show. Today's guest is Leonard Atlas. He's with Mission Profitable Incorporated. Uh, Leonard is a sales trainer working with commercial real estate professionals around the world. Uh, he's not a proponent of the ABCs, always be closing, but rather of the 80-20 Pareto's principle. Um, today, Leonard will be sharing how to be a better negotiator in a seller's market. Leonard brings a real-world and in-your-face approach to getting the message across. Uh, he creates an environment of trust and openness that lets participants identify and eliminate uh, limiting beliefs and behaviors. And one more thing before we go, if you are interested, I just want you to know that you can download the presentation, uh, the slides for the presentation on the link in the show notes there. Uh, if you want to do that before you listen, that way you can take any notes if you like. But uh, here now, here's Leonard Atlas. With me on the line today is Leonard Atlas. He's with Mission Profitable Incorporated. He's a business and sales trainer. He's taught real estate professionals throughout the world, including Jones Lang LaSalle, uh, C.B. Richard Ellis, and Cushman Wakefield. Leonard, welcome to the program. Thank you, Darren. My pleasure to be here. Uh, well, before we get going here, if you could just do me one little favor and for our listeners, uh, tell a little bit more about your background and, and uh, what you do. Well, uh, my original career was in a family business back in New York, so you can tell by the accent I'm not a native of Los Angeles. Uh, and my family had been for many years, since 1946, in the special event and floral decorating industry. So my orientation was not to sales, but rather to floral design and floral decorations. And um, I noticed that my father and uncles were selling, uh, each very differently from one another, but very effectively. And as a young man, I started trying to copy them and emulate them, and it wasn't working. There were people in their 50s. I was a young guy in 18, 19, and it was not working. So I started going to all these sales training workshops in New York City, and all the big guys would come in for the one-day wonder workshops, and I'd go, and I'd get all excited, and I'd find out that they were really all about selling books and tapes in the back of the room, that the material wasn't very effective. So I sought out in the 80s to come up with a sales strategy that would work for me and be effective for me and my sales team. And a friend of mine that was in college at the time, he introduced me to Pareto's principle, also known as the 80-20 rule. And it was a fascinating, counterintuitive concept. And it took me from being the typical New York aggressive salesperson to always be closing that whole concept, feeling pressure, to all of a sudden looking to disqualify the people that weren't really likely prospects and weren't going to buy and were wasting time and resources 
And that was really the genesis of Mission Profitable, uh, kind of by accident. But it was in the late 80s, and I've since then taken it. And with my colleagues, we've trained in about 18 countries around the world. A lot of folks in commercial real estate, but also financial services, insurance, energy, HVAC, many industries. In fact, we're, we're, we're product and industry agnostic because the, what we're teaching is really uh, interpersonal and psychological communications and how to help prospects feel comfortable making the right decision. And if the right decision is not to move forward with this transaction, let's figure that out quickly and inexpensively. So that's the origin of it. And over the last 20 years, we've been very successful to do the business both worldwide uh, and domestically with, with young startups as well as Fortune 100 companies. So it works across the board if and when people are ready to uh, embrace a new sales strategy and philosophy. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, and and the uh, one thing I want to point out to our listeners, too, is that uh, before you get going in this, there is an attachment uh, to this uh, program, and you can download the the uh, uh, presentation that Leonard's going to go through here with us, but um, uh, so you have that. So shall we get started? Yeah, and let me just share with you the genesis of this talk that we're going to do today. Uh, a few months ago, I was hired to give a speech at a real estate investment conference. There were going to be 500 people there, and I was told I was a keynote speaker. I had an hour. So I was planning a talk for an hour. The week before, the host called me and said, we got a lot of people on the roster. I've got to cut you down to 40 minutes. I said, okay. So I started chopping away content. And two days before the conference, the conference, I was notified I had 20 minutes. I was the 8 a.m. speaker at 20 minutes. So I had to really um, get in and get out and get a message across. And my, my job was not to just sell my company and make a commercial for me, but to give the participants real value. So what you guys are going to hear right now is something that we did live in 20 minutes. And it was so effective that we were invited back to be the afternoon speaker as well. So I had to do a little impromptu, which we're not going to do today. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a presentation that we dealt for the real estate market. And as you can see, the, the topic is how to be a better negotiator in a seller's market. So we're going to first run through some negotiation principles, many that people know and just forgot, some maybe they're not familiar with. And then at the end of that, we'll have a few minutes to talk about some of the main sales concepts that we teach to help people go from where they are currently in a comfort zone to the next level and really take their to, to, uh, to what they're capable of producing. So if I can ask you to change the slide. So Hang on slide two, you'll simply see here's a list of many of the clients we've worked with, and many of them are recognizable names in real estate and financial services, et cetera. But again, we're teaching uh, interpersonal communication, so the industry sector is less relevant. All right, let's go to the next slide and dig in. So these are from our reality-based negotiating workshop, and they were concepts that I thought would be very valuable for the audience to, get a, to, to hear and uh, to reinforce. So the first one is you're going to be lied to. You know, uh, I, I'd like to say we live in an honest, trustworthy world, but that's just not the truth. The reality is you're going to be lied to, and we need to be prepared for that reality. Can't say it's not fair. Can't say I don't like it. It's just part of the, part of the game. Number two is you must look out for yourself. Sounds pretty obvious, but yet I have so many clients come to us and say, I was so concerned with the other party, and they don't finish the sentence, but the other sentence was there was nobody looking after me. So the reality is you, whether you're an individual or a company, have to come up with what's important to you, what are your negotiables, what are your non-negotiables, and you have to make sure that they're being met because your counterparty is not there for them. They're there, they're there for them, not for you. So right. it sounds obvious, but a lot of people just in the heat of the moment, they get emotionally involved or they feel like a social worker, and they're protecting the other side and not their own interests. All right, number three is you can't influence a company, only individuals. And that's important because... The decision at the other side might be the company, but it's made up of individuals in singular or plural. So we really want to address how many counterparts are there that need to be influenced, how many are there as decision makers, and actually who are the deal breakers. We find in almost every transaction there are those influencers, the people walking us in, the decision makers, the people that are going to ultimately make the final decision, but there's usually a deal breaker, somebody who has a vested interest in not seeing the deal go through. So we want to help you identify each of those people early on find out what their agenda is, and when we apply the 80-20 process, if the deal is meant to be broken and the, these deal breakers are really serious about it not going forward, acknowledging that and moving on and not presenting and sharing your intellectual capital and giving away your secret sauce. Right. Uh, fourth is, you, you, you agree so far, Darren? Oh, absolutely. I love it. Yeah, I'm taking notes. Good. So negotiating with people is unpredictable. I cannot tell you how many times I've had people say to me, but I did a deal with this guy a couple of months ago and it was a different outcome. So, well, different deals are different circumstances. So negotiating is unpredictable. It's subject to people's emotions, sometimes their whims, 
you're seeing the political debates, you're hearing a lot of that kind of stuff, just made up on the, at the seat of the moment, you know? So it is unpredictable. And because somebody was cooperative on the last deal does not mean they're going to be cooperative on the next deal. And likely, you know, the same, by the same token, because they were very hard to deal with in the past transaction does not mean they're going to be hard to deal with in the next transaction. There are all these circumstances that we really have to look at each deal individually. And, of course, it's good to have a history and know something about the people, but don't expect it's always going to repeat that way. Uh, the next one is really one that we start with, and there are no rules. You know, so when people change the rules and say, if you come in low, you get the deal, but then you don't get the deal, there are no rules. So it's only our inner child that says, but that's not fair. You told me if I did A, B, and C, I'd get the deal. Well, whoever said business was supposed to be fair. Right. It's, it's not fair, and there are no rules. Oh, and that's that's a painful one, especially when you try and work them down the path and say, you know, try and guide them. Now, if we meet these conditions, are we going to be able to do business, you know? And, and they say uh, yes, and, and three yeah. weeks later, you feel you met those conditions, and you still don't get the deal. And you're saying, right. what happened here? Well, something new happened. Somebody new came to the table. Things changed. Whatever. You know, so this rule is there are no rules. The next one, if I was doing the full list, would be, and those rules are subject to change. Right. So imagine where there are no <laughs> rules, and they're subject to change from call to call, meeting to meeting, transaction to transaction. <clears throat> and that can be uh, confusing and frustrating for people in the business. So we invite them not to get emotionally involved. And we're going to talk later about abundance and scarcity, but when you come from scarcity, so you're doing too few deals and they're too far apart, you kind of feel like you need each deal to happen. So when it's going south and it's falling apart, you can't handle that. Financially, emotionally, you can't handle that. You need this deal to close. So you're emotionally involved and your judgment gets clouded. But when you recognize from the get-go, there are no rules and they are subject to change, I have to deal with what I have at the moment. And until the right. deal is signed, still delivered, it's not done. Right, right. All right. Next is, you're not always going to have leverage. So sometimes you have to be prepared to walk out. Right? It, when you have no leverage and it's not going the way you want, rather than accept an unacceptable deal or unacceptable terms, you may have to say, guys, you know what? It's just not working for us. I, I know you have all the leverage. We don't. But simply, I, I can't say yes to this deal. It's not in our best interest. But isn't that, and in I a way, think, leverage itself by... <clears throat> by uh you know, walking away from the table? I mean, are you not? Absolutely. Hmm. If you are not prepared to walk away from the table, you, you have, have no leverage. leverage. Yeah. You have no leverage. If they know you need this deal, if you've told them how desperate you are or how, you know, how long it's been or whatever, whatever sob story you've told them, you've now really depleted any leverage you have because they know they got you. And right. whatever they say, whatever reductions, whatever changes they make, you're going to agree to, you're out of business. And my company is called Mission Profitable. So I'm here not to help just get the deal closed, but make sure it's closed profitably for both parties. Right. And when you have no leverage, you have to act accordingly. And the best way to act accordingly is to come from abundance, knowing you have other deals behind this. So if this one doesn't close, doesn't mean I don't feed my family. I have other deals happening. Right. That's a very important when you're not having leverage. Last on this page is <clears throat> things are never as good as, or as bad as they seem in the heat of the moment. So we talk about... Almost every single decision in this world is made emotionally, but it's rationalized or justified intellectually. So there is an emotional and an intellectual component to almost every single decision we make. We need to think in advance of our meetings, our negotiations, what are those deal points that, again, are negotiable or not negotiable, so that when we're in the heat of the moment, we're not exaggerating. Uh, salespeople tend to over-exaggerate how good things are, and business owners tend to underestimate how bad they are. And I'm just saying, cut the lows, cut the highs, and just be real about it. What is the reality of this deal at this moment? Right. Right. All right so That's... let's turn the slide, please. All right. Last page of these rules. So every negotiator has a different set of rules. And, and, and furthermore, every negotiator may have a different set of rules at every negotiation. So the reality is we have to be prepared to deal with different personality types. Uh, one of my colleagues divides the world into three categories. She says people are sharks, dolphin, or tuna. Sharks kill for a living. Their job is to kill. They're not there for win-win. They're there to, to just kill and eat and, and, and just do havoc. Tuna get killed. They get eaten. Dolphin are the ones that play in groups and want to see a win-win. 
So I looked to, and I, I, I've heard that many years ago, about 15 years ago, from her, her name was Shelly Campbell. And Shelly has a couple of books out. And when I started thinking about people as sharks, dolphin, and tuna, I realized that each group has their own set of rules. But within each category, there are still going to be different rules. And the reality is we have to be on our toes. We have to be aggressive. We have to be actively listening. I did a workshop last week for the real estate industry, and so many of the people were caught not listening. You know, Darren, you ever get into a conversation with somebody and you're so intent to think about what you're going to say next that you forget to listen to what they just told you? It happens, unfortunately. And that's where we lose our edge. So by recognizing everybody has a different set of rules and they change constantly, that's going to help you pay better attention and do what we refer to as active listening more. So the more active listening you do, the more you're prepared for the rules to change on a moment's notice. And the next one is rules are subject to change. You know, so how many times have we been told, you come in with the following conditions and you got the deal, and you come in with those conditions and, and you don't get the deal? Well, the rules are subject to change. Now, that may mean that your counterpart has new options and new leverage, or they may be bluffing and testing you out. So again, if you're coming from scarcity, you're never going to risk saying, so I guess the deal's over. You just changed the rules, it's over. I can't accept this. But if you come from abundance, you might say, you know what, Darren, this is not the deal we agreed to. I worked with my team to get to what we talked about last week, and now it's totally changed. I got to take the deal off the table. It doesn't work for us anymore. Right. And right. I have to be prepared to walk away because the rules changed. Right. And that really goes hand in hand with the next one, which is take measured risk. There are times you have to bluff a walkout. Mm -hmm. And there are times that you could be sincere about it, but you've got to take measured risk. And measured risk, measured risk means you've really thought about this, you've discussed this internally, you've calculated what it means, and you're prepared to take that risk. And if it means blowing up the deal, you're prepared to lose the deal. Yeah, I think one of the toughest lessons for people in business to learn is when to say no. Oh, absolutely, especially in sales. We so the outside that we want to say yes to everything. Yep. But we know every deal's not right. Right. Uh, and just uh, the, the perspective there of, of, of recognizing your limits and, uh, you know, kind of putting some respect in the deal. On, I mean, respecting yourself uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, always a new low uh, that you're willing to accept. Well, you just said two great words, respect and limits. Mm -hmm. Hey, first, we have to know our limits. So take measured risk means what are your limits? How high will you go? How low will you go? You have to know that in advance when you're not emotionally involved. At the seat of the table and when you're negotiating, you're emotionally involved. You want to get this deal done. So you have to know your limits before that beforehand, uh, and you have to respect the process. And again, respect their leverage, your leverage, their lack of leverage, your lack of leverage. So you've got to really keep looking at everything through a microscope and not relying upon the past. That, that's the real, the real main concept here. And next yeah. we move into pigs get slaughtered. Um, I truly look to help my clients negotiate win-win deals, especially in the real estate sector, where the reality is you're going to wind up at the table with these people again in the future. It may be next week, next month, next year, five years now, but it's such a small industry and community at the end of the day that we find people doing multiple transactions with the same people. So if you negotiate the current deal like a pig, you try to get every last penny out of it and suck everything out of it, and it's not win-win, chances are you, you may get some satisfaction short-term on this deal, but what happens when they don't take your call the next deal, and, or they don't offer you an opportunity the next deal? Was it, did it make sense to really suck every nickel out of it at the time? Right. So pigs get slaughtered. I, 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 I don't look to get every single penny out of the, out of the deal if it's going to hurt my relationship long term. <clears throat> next is identify and distinguish between uh, problems and obstacles. So, by the way, many people use the word problems incorrectly because problems have no known solution available. So when, when I say to you, Darren, we have a problem, I'm basically saying we have an issue that we can't fix. So I like, to I, I like to not use the word problems as much as possible and talk about obstacles, challenges, glitches, issues to overcome. And it, it may sound like semantics, but it really isn't. It's part of NLP, Neuro Linguistics Programming. The words we use, use us. So when we talk about problems or obstacles or issues, it is what it is. So what is the reality? Are we miles apart and we'll never get together? Is the entitlement not finished? I mean, what are the issues, and can we deal with it or not? Doesn't mean we have to walk away. Doesn't mean we have to suggest a hiatus. Guys, sounds like you have to do a little bit of rethinking on, on your side, or you have to get some credit things taken care of, or whatever it might be, or the entitlement's taken care of. How about we, we regroup in a week or two once you have that taken care of? So if the deal is not ready to be finished and negotiated right now, it is what it is. It's not a ready deal. Leave it for the time being. 
don't screw it up intentionally at the wrong time. Just distinguish where you're at, what it is, and what's the best way to move forward. Right. In my own personal experience, every time I run into an obstacle with a prospect who's not a client yet, and I say, it sounds like we're both not ready to do this transaction, how about we regroup? I would say nearly 100% of the time there's respect involved, and we actually do the deal a couple of weeks later, but we do the deal the right way instead of trying to force it now. So I, I'm really a real proponent of that issue. The last one is there are legitimate circumstances when it's okay to cease negotiating. So when you're being lied to and they're fundamental lies, they're important lies, when you're not being respected and it's an ongoing deal and you're going to have to work together and you just don't like these people, you just don't get along, I refer to it as it's either chemistry or catastrophe. When a relationship is chemistry, we're getting along, we respect each other, you've got to make a living, I've got to make a living. But when it's catastrophe, and typically with the sharks, and they don't care about you at all, and they're happy to have you lose money on the deal, it may make sense to cease negotiating. Uh, I, I, and basically, the other time when it's okay to cease negotiating is when the other side is not hearing you. When you're talking and saying, this is what we need, this is how we do it, et cetera, et cetera, and they're just not hearing you, they're steamrolling past it, it could be time to stop negotiating because you're not, you, you, you're, you're not getting your needs met intellectually or emotionally. What kind of deal is that? Right. You know, I, I just want to go back to that last, uh, the one before here, the um, identify and distinguish the problem or distinguish problems from obstacles. You know, one of the things that it just occurred to me is that that's kind of a, a, a closure point. Uh, if it's not going to happen, let go of it, you know, and, and, and put your energies elsewhere as opposed to continue to try and try and try and try something that's already not going to happen right now. Uh, so you're helping with our transition away from negotiating into the 80-20 sales concept, which is probably the next slide, I believe. But we're talking about, uh, you know, the 80-20 rule says that 80% of our efforts produce 20% of the results, but 20% of our efforts produce 80% of the results. So we may be involved in a deal early on or at the negotiating table <clears throat> that might wind up being part of the 80% of our pool of stuff that does not happen. So as much as we're teaching our clients what to do correctly, we're also teaching them what not to do. Right. And like you're saying, there are signs on the table. There are signs in the communication about deals that are not going to happen. Don't you owe it to yourself to identify those signs as early as possible? Right. Just I had be honest with yourself. Company. Sorry? Be honest with yourself. Yeah. I mean, one, one, one real estate company hired me. They had about 20 offices around the country with about 200 people throughout those offices. And the year before they hired me, they alleged they spent $6 million creating proposals and presentations that did not close. Wow. $6 million between 20 offices on an annual basis with research, analysis, architectural renderings, the whole thing. So my first job there was just to teach these folks discretion and create a criteria what is an acceptable deal and what is not acceptable? And as soon as we can identify it's not acceptable, they're not credit worthy or the timing's wrong or they have an incumbent relationship too strong, whatever it might be, put that on the table and say, guys, we can't overcome this, right? You already got somebody. You don't need me. Look to disqualify instead of pre-qualify and your world changes immediately. Um, well said. Now, let's go to the next slide and, and, and keep moving forward because the next slide is actually a book that my training partner, Peter Farkas, and I have coming out. Peter's an attorney, actually a real estate attorney, and uh, he's done very well with us in the training world because he has the uh, practical experience being involved in the real estate deals and as an attorney, me as a long-term trainer. But our book is called What's Holding Your Sales Back? Find Them, Face Them, and Fix Them. And when we go to the next slide, I'll tell you the three things we found. So about 20 some odd years, 18 countries, hundreds of thousands of people taught, we have found that three things hold people's sales back. All right? And I'm using the word sales, Darren. I hope that's not a four-letter word. I hope sales is not a curse word to the audience. They realize that they're selling. No, I think everybody's selling all the time. You have to realize that whether you're a buyer or a seller. Yeah. Here are the three things we found interviewing all of our clients and the management behind the clients. Number one, what's holding their sales back? They don't talk to enough people. They're simply not. Should I go to the next slide? Right? There we go. Yep. Okay. There you go. Number two, they're often not talking to the right people. They're so afraid of rejection that they, they sabotage themselves unknowingly by talking to people too low down the ladder. People that can't say yes, they can only say no. Right. So because they're not feeling comfortable and confident, they talk to the wrong people. And third and final, we find that a lot of people simply don't know what to say or do under various circumstances, especially the high pressure circumstances. So all three of these issues, not talking to enough people, the right people, or knowing what to say or do, have both an art and a science component to them. 
And in our trainings, we deal with both the art and science of professional selling. So let's go to the next slide, please. So we've had a keynote speech that we've given for years and years. It's called Brooklyn to Bel Air, the Big Five. And it happens to be my life story. Uh, originally in Brooklyn uh, and a floral decorating, so blue collar, and then migrating into professional sales development and, and sales performance to white collar. So it's my transition both physically from Brooklyn to Bel Air, where I moved from, but also literally from blue collar to white collar. And there are five elements we've identified, five components of selling that affect every single person every single day in sales. So let's run through these five real quickly as an overview. And by the way, I'm not trying to do a uh, a representation of our three-day workshop in 20 minutes, just trying to give you the high points that you can think about these things while you listen to this podcast and start making some adjustments. The first one is your mindset. It's the absolute foundation. If your mindset is one of abundance, there are a ton of people out there, there's a ton of deals out there, it's my job to uncover the best ones, that's a healthy attitude. As soon as you come from scarcity, oh, the economy's in a downturn and you can't get loans anymore and they're not doing any building and it's really tough and so few deals. Now you feel scarcity and um, it's frustrating. And that frustration never allows you to operate from a good place. And again, you have less leverage when you come from scarcity. So we advise people, when you really are legitimately coming from scarcity, you got to change your offering. Either you have to be involved in more kinds of deals, different kinds of deals, or change your geographic, geographic scope. I'm working with one client that started out with me in Southern California and said, when they hired me, we want to expand nationally and internationally. And in the six or seven months we've been working together, we're now looking at deals in Texas, Colorado, New York, Mexico, uh, Peru, a number of countries. So they found that rather than rely upon just a pool of LA, they'd rather participate in multiple pools around the world. And I appreciate that because now they're coming from total abundance. Right. So it really comes to your mindset. Let's go to the next slide, please. So your behavior, and I'm I'm talking about the behavior of the stuff that is uncomfortable, the things we don't like to do, and that's typically prospecting. Now, I'm not advocating cold calling, because many people listening to this podcast that have been in the real estate industry for 10, 15, 20 plus years, they don't need to make a cold call. They have a big enough network, and through LinkedIn, they have a huge referral resource base there that they can tap into, but even the new people coming into the business. The hardest thing you will ever do is pick up the phone and call a stranger. Now, why is that hard? Because most of us had parents growing up telling us, don't talk to strangers. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, talking about money is rude. So the two things that we need to do in real estate and sales, talk to strangers about money, we've been told from childhood are bad things. So if you've got mom looking over one shoulder of yours and your manager or boss or partner looking over the other shoulder, who do you think is going to win? Mom. Yeah. So for that reason, most people do not prospect for business consistently. So in our workshops and our private coaching, we help every single client come up with their daily minimum behavior number. What will be the minimum amount of behaviors? And behaviors 10 years ago was only dialing the phone. But today, email is very acceptable. LinkedIn is very acceptable. So there are a lot of techniques that we teach and we include in our program that have less rejection built in. So it's not about you calling somebody, helping to reach them, them getting on the phone and not be argumentative or or aggressive with you. We can be very effective. And by the way, we met through email and LinkedIn, right? We met on LinkedIn through your group. Exactly. And and here we are working together. So proof in point of of how you don't have to just use the phone or knocking on doors like in the old-fashioned days. We can combine low-tech and high-tech. And actually, in our workshops, we talk about the three ways to generate business. Low-tech, like phone and networking face-to-face. High-tech, like email, LinkedIn, and Facebook, and then search engines. But also one that we trademarked, and that's cockroach marketing. Originally from New York, so I had to bring my roots in. And the answer, you know, I ask people in the workshops, how do cockroaches get into a property? And the answer is through the cracks. Through the cracks, there you go. And I developed this because a lot of my clients would say to me, I called the guy four times, he never, he never returned my calls, I'm giving up on him. Or I sent him three emails, he never responds to the emails. And I said, but a cockroach wouldn't give up. If a cockroach made the phone calls and never got back, they'd email. And if the email didn't work, they would go to LinkedIn. And we'd go to their website and we'd find another person in the company. We would find a way in if we were really aggressive. Right. So, or zealous, you know. So the behavior has to be consistent. I help everybody come up with a manageable number of behaviors they can do a day. It could be one a day, two a day, five a day, whatever it is, but constantly keep building your pipeline. Instead of waiting for, uh uh-oh, deal flow is over, I'm dry, the pipeline is empty, i got to crank it up and make 100 dials a day. Nobody wants to make 100 dials a day, and if you did it on Monday, you're certainly not doing it again on Tuesday. 
Right. You're just consistent throughout the week, making two, five, eight, ten, whatever that number is, every single day. And it's not about clock time. So I never want to hear somebody say, I prospect for an hour a day. Because in an hour, you could, be, you could stay on two calls for 30 minutes each and think you're productive. But if your number is you've got to talk to 10 people a day, two long conversations doesn't do the trick. So we actually have people focus on goal time, G-O-A-L. And the goal is always how many, how many behaviors do they want to initiate a day. And from there, we create a recipe. All right, let's go to the next slide. I like it. All right. So now we're talking about technique. So as we build this story, and your mindset is one of abundance, and your behavior is consistent on a daily basis, now it's a matter of what are your techniques. And as we talked about from the beginning of the call, we're teaching Pareto's principle, a.k.a. the 80-20 rule. So let's go to the next slide and describe that. So here is the actual verbiage of the 80-20 rule. Concentrate on the vital few. Ignore, delegate, or delay the trivial many. Now, when we recognize that if we had 10 deals in front of us or 10 prospects in front of us, we're not going to close six, seven, eight, nine, or 10 of those. Is that right, Darren? Uh, that'd be a good day. But if I you looked at 10 deals, you might close two if you're lucky. Right. So instead of looking at them through rosy-eyed glasses of, oh, they're all great, oh, my God, they're all wonderful, and trying to pre-qualify them, they all fit our size and our dollar amount, and they're all wonderful deals – we encourage you to go the opposite and look to disqualify. Take those 10 deals and immediately what can we identify that knocks them out? Knocks three or four of them right out of the park. We don't stand a chance. They already have funding. They already have lenders. They already have whatever it is. What are the things we can identify immediately? And then we can put it to them and say, Darren, so fair to say you don't need this deal. You already have it figured out. <laughs> so now we're down to nine. <clears throat> and as we keep disqualifying, what happens is we wind up being left with the smaller number of quality deals with a much higher likelihood of closing. Right, and, and a recognized opportunity and, and on both sides. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming through the process that the the buyer, the person you're trying to sell to, has there's some acknowledgement that's going on there that, that you recognize, on it's mutually recognized that there's an opportunity. Yes, and, and to your point, the sooner you mutually recognize, you know what, you're not right for this deal, I don't need you for that deal, because we didn't take a to, to the to, to the uh, to the nth degree, and because we didn't take it to so far down the track, and, and uh, you know affected each other, hurt each other, said something wrong, rejected each other, but the fact that we did it upfront, quickly, gentlemanly, maturely, means that we've left the door open for other opportunities. And how many times can the people listening to this podcast uh, identify? They met somebody for one deal, it didn't happen, but they both enjoyed the working together, and they found another deal later that, that worked, that made sense. Oh yeah. You know, so by disqualifying deals today does not mean you disqualify the relationship. You just disqualify that particular deal, that transaction. Yep. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we're talking about really two things. Disqualifying, which means comfortably going for the no, and probing. Now, probing is a simple little word, but it has a lot of connotation. Probing means asking questions, not rhetorical, superficial questions, but we teach people how to dig deep into the issue and really help the prospect quantify what that issue, we call it a pain, what that pain is costing them financially, emotionally, time-wise, etc. and then what are their options. So probing is not just saying, so you like to get this deal done, right? That's not probing. Probing is really finding out, so how long has it been on the table and how come it hasn't happened and why have the other people said no? And what would a good deal look like? Asking a lot of questions without giving away your intellectual property. All too often, people in business and sales are so intent on getting their knowledge, their professional information across to the counterpart that they're giving away their intellectual property or their secret sauce, but they're not learning anything about the, the counterpart or the transaction. So they've given away free information. We call that unpaid consulting. And they haven't gotten anything back. And they haven't even closed the deal. So we really want to prevent how much you do of talking and encourage you to do a lot more listening and asking. Yeah, I like the, the, the probe, uh, you know, not just uh, shooting the breeze, but actually getting to the, some qualifying pain points. Uh, and like an solve. onion, and we talk about this, like an onion, we're talking about peeling back the layers deep, deep, deep to get to the heart of the issue. Right. And once you get to the heart of the issue with somebody, they are much more likely actually to do transactions with you and to do business with you because you uncovered their pain. You didn't create their pain. You uncovered it. Right. Now, now you also have something pain, to work on. The pleasure they're going to get by doing the deal. So it's right. both, both sides of the coin. But once you find that pain, you have something to solve. I mean, there is, there is something you can bring to it that, that perhaps the others 
uh, the competition's not aware of or, or unable to satisfy. Yes, but also you identify, so when I find your pain, and I say, Darren, how long have you been experiencing this? And you say three years, five years, eight years. So, but, but why now? You know, you've been living with this pain for so long. You sure you want to settle for it? And, and how many deals do we think are going to happen? And then the, at the last minute, they back out and say, no, we're not going to sell. We're going to keep it in our family. Why? Because nobody ever quantified the pain and, and brought a solution that made sense. So they're used to there being no solution. Right. So quantifying the pain and finding out how long it's been an issue in terms of time and frustration, what other options they've said no to, under what circumstances would they consider a deal, all this probing happens before you give away your solutions. Yep. It really keeps you in control of the process, and that's what we're aiming to do. We're aiming to, to keep our clients and our students in control of their prospecting, sales, and negotiating from beginning to end. Like all right, it. let's uh, wrap up. We're almost there. All right, so next we've combined number four and five, and that's rewards and patience. <laughs> so rewards is a, is a synonym for goal setting, but goal setting is so uh, overused that I think people get turned off when they hear the term. But rewards basically are, if you're going to stay in this business of yours, short-term, medium-term, and long-term. So I define short-term as within a year, medium is within five years, long-term is five years and above. What's in it for you? What do you want to see happen? What do you want to see your income grow by? And the nice thing is, in most organizations, there are people in the business that much longer than you, five years longer, 10 years longer, 20 years longer than you. So you can look and say, wow, they're making $3 million a year. That's available to me. If I stay with this thing long enough, if I develop a good network, and if I access these kind of deals, I can make that kind of money too. So you have to first identify your rewards, have some role models and some mentors to shoot for and to benchmark it with. And then there's one thing I love to use about rewards, and that is, it's not the how, it's the why. So when you know what the rewards are to you and your family, and they can be financial or non-financially motivated, but when you know what the rewards are, you'll figure out the how. And right. patience, patience is simply an acknowledgement of, you know, when I was a kid growing up, it took my mother two hours to make a baked potato. And by the time I was in college and microwave ovens came out, all of a sudden a baked potato could be made in 10 minutes, we lost our patience. Right. You remember 15 years ago, you'd call a salesperson or somebody on a deal, and you'd say, mail me a brochure, and we'd wait a week for it to attend? You know, for it to arrive in the mail. Right. And right. now we, we go to a website. Statistically, I understand if a web page doesn't open up in four seconds, people leave the page. Wow. We used to wait a week for the thing to arrive in the mail. Now we won't wait four seconds. Right. And it's true. I mean, aren't we all guilty of we can't, the page's not loading? We leave. Yep. If they yep. see people amateurs, they can't even get their website going. Yeah. So the, the point is, whether people take on 80-20 selling or reality-based negotiating, or whatever new skill set they're going to learn, it takes patience. You're not going to double your income tomorrow. It could take a couple of years. Be patient. Have that long-term perspective. So we're talking short-term, medium, and long-term. What are the things that you can do in the short-term, the medium, and the long-term? So in the short-term, it's listening to this kind of webinar, absolutely. In the medium-term, it might be hiring a lead generator, getting an appointment booker, uh, making more referral agents. could be attending one of our workshops. Uh, you know, Darren, you and I talked about, we have two workshop series planned in Los Angeles. One will likely be in June, one will likely be in August. These are our three-day 80-20 intro workshops. We haven't selected the venues yet, uh, but as we do that, I'll promote that to you. And we've talked about giving your audience a special financial incentive to participate. So if anybody listening to this is interested in, in potentially attending or sending their team to a workshop in Southern California in the June time frame and August time frame to help them with their sales and negotiating, that's something they could do between the short and medium term to create a long-term result. Okay? I like it. I like it. And I think, uh, so the, la the last slide is really my, my mantra. If you aren't having fun, you're doing it wrong. You know, we come to work 8, 9, 10, 12 hours a day, 5, 6 days a week, 50 weeks a year, 30, 40 years of our life, and most people don't enjoy it. And, and, and those are the people not making as much money uh, and building as many relationships. But the people who figure out how to have fun doing what they're doing, so to me that means starting working with dolphins. I try not to work a lot with tuna or sharks. Sometimes you have to. But I try to really focus on working with cooperative people that are truly there for a win-win mutual outcome that I want to do repeat deals with. Um, and I find a way to have fun with it. And, and for some people, it's time management. So what that means is don't think about your workday being from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Personally, I work in two- to three-hour sectors. I work for two- to three hours, then I take a break. And I go work out or, or I go for lunch with my kids or, or a friend 
or I go hiking in the middle of the day, I will break up the day because I find in this technological world we work in, we're not working, you know, eight to six. We're working nights and weekends. We get emails and texts, and we're, we're always on the computer. So if we're going to work at 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night, if we're going to put a couple hours on the weekend, it's, cool. it, it's all right to take an hour or two off on a Tuesday or Wednesday and go have fun and make a break in the middle of the day. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, I, I love that you say that and reiterate it because I think, uh, you know, looking back to where you come from, and I know my dad, he got in the car and drove down to work and turned around and came home at night, and it was it was the same road every day, every day, every day. It's, it was kind of the model I saw. Uh, but you're absolutely right. The technology, I mean, 24-7, it seems like uh, you are available, and it's almost expected in some situations. So you really do have to kind of have the discipline to find the time for yourself uh, to get away from it and, uh, you know, can recharge and, and sharpen the, the ax or the blade or whatever, just uh, get your mind kind of clear there. But I like that. And for me personally, I find that I'm very productive 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night when everybody's asleep, it's quiet, there's no phones ringing, no emails coming in, and I can work on concentrating on, on, on some of the projects I have to work on. So if I'm going to work from, you know, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, I feel entitled to take an hour or two off during the day and go have fun. Now, again, I'm not talking about staff and employees that need to be answering the phones and doing things from 9 to 5. That's different. I'm talking about the people that are the workaholics, the rainmakers, the people driving the business. You put in your 50, 60, 70 hours a week, it doesn't matter when you work. It matters what kind of results you get. So I'm very much result-oriented, but I help people enjoy the process as well. So really, that's the message I'm going to leave you with. We all want to achieve amazing results, but you have to enjoy and respect the process. And part of my work is to help people identify what is the smartest process for them to go for. You know, usually it's about this disqualification, helping get rid of the 80% that don't make sense. So I'm just left with the 20% that have 80% likelihood of closing. So, Darren, I hope that this uh, podcast impacts some of your audience. I hope they get some real immediate benefit out of it. And, again, if any of them want to uh, reach us, they can go to missionprofitable.com or send me an email at atlas at missionprofitable.com, and my phone number is on the screen. Look forward to hearing from them. Uh, as you can see, we have worked extensively in commercial real estate and finance for the last 20 years, so we're happy to be a resource if and when we can make sense. And if not, there are a lot of other good training companies out there. But if you're not reaching your goals, make sure that you're not just um, settling and saying, oh, that's my lot in life. I'm not meant to, to make a lot of money. Go figure it out. Get, get the right resource, whether it's me or somebody else. So, Darren, I want to thank you for this opportunity to talk with your audience, and I look forward to being in touch with them and, and, and you and staying in touch and helping close deals. I like it. Leonard, thanks a bunch. I really appreciate you taking the time today to share this with us and uh, look forward to talking to you soon. Likewise. Have a great day. Well, I just want to thank you for taking time to listen today. Uh, we know you're busy and we do appreciate you taking the time to out of your busy day to, to listen for uh, listen with us. Uh, I hope you found something you can use in Leonard's presentation. I think it's always good to um, have a little brush up, a little refresher, and uh, you know, remember the uh, you gotta you gotta be looking out for yourself out there in the sales world, and that it's always always changing. As you heard Leonard mention, uh, he has some courses coming up here uh, this summer, and if you decide to uh, participate in any of his courses, be sure to mention our program, uh, Commercial Real Estate Pro Network, and uh, CREPN Radio, and he will provide an appropriate discount. Uh, also, don't forget to check out his website. That's Mission Profitable. Dot com. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio. You're listening to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals. For more information on this or any of our guests, like us on Facebook, CREPN Radio.